are looking beyond land and into the sea. Singapore has also mapped out its marine and coastal habitats to help guide developments around these areas. It has found that these marine ecosystems are generally self-sustaining. It used data for four representative organisms, mangrove seeds and seagrass, coral and sea star larva, to map how they connect between coastal and marine habitats. The arrows indicate how these habitats, such as mangroves and coral reefs, are linked. And Park says it plans to study how developments can take all this into consideration and explore how they can enhance and restore these habitats. Let's take a deeper dive into this issue with Dr. Zihan Jafar from the Department of Biological Sciences at NUS. She's also a member of the Scientific Advisory Panel for NPARC's Terrestrial and Marine Study. Good evening, Dr. Zihan. Your research, it helped to end NPARC's in this study. What did the team take into consideration when looking at marine connectivity here in Singapore? Hi, good evening. Um, that is correct. Uh, you know, I was part of the of the team that uh, looked into how we can enhance marine connectivity in Singapore. We looked at uh, core habitats within the marine ecosystem. Uh, these are coastal forests, mangrove, uh, seagrass meadows, intertidal flats and coral reefs. Uh, and then we identified uh, these uh, core habitats based on factors such as, you know, how diverse they are for that area, the quality of the habitat, the condition of the habitat, and all these went into the planning framework. Your study focused on four organisms in particular, uh, mangrove seeds, seagrass, coral, as well as sea star larva. So what did they specifically mm -hmm. reveal? Uh, well, let me uh, dial back a bit uh, and explain why these four were chosen. So um, two of them are representative of, of plants, you know, so the mangrove propagules as well as the sea, uh, seagrass fragments uh, are plants and, you know, the way that they move are slightly different. Uh, the other two representatives are animals, invertebrate marine animals, and they are sea star and, and coral. And with many marine animals, uh, you know, they are young, uh, suspended in water and carried uh, through the water to new areas, right? So, so that's why we were looking at sea star larvae and coral larvae. So these studies were done, and um, these four representative organisms, the way that they moved uh, were, were uh, put into a model. So this is called the agent-based modeling system. Uh, they, uh, we also actually looked at how uh, hydro, hydrodynamic currents uh, impact the way they move. And we looked at the net direction of current flows. Uh, and together with genetic data, we then can determine how areas uh, are connected to each other. Hmm. So about connectivity in Singapore and, and, and what it means uh, for development, we do have a range of marine biodiversity here uh, in Singapore. Why is it important when we consider that concept of connectivity as far as uh, the marine environment is concerned? Okay, well, connectivity between and within these core areas are actually very important to maintain species and genetic diversity. Uh, and this is really uh, important because, you know, we are very uh, reliant on many marine species and, and this includes economically important species that we consume, like the seafood that we consume. Uh, but this is especially also most important to maintain ecological resilience because connectivity improves uh, capacity of ecosystems to adapt to climate change. Uh, we know that distribution and movement of animals are expected to change due to global warming. So um, by understanding how they move, where they move to, uh, where they'll settle, how they will settle, uh, so in short, their connectivity throughout these systems, then we can also better adapt to climate change and make our ecosystems more resilient to these changes. Mm. Well, Singapore has long had a need and a wish, a goal perhaps, to live side by side in some sort of balance with nature. How will all of this information uh, be used perhaps in terms of planning our city? Okay, so once we, 
we can facilitate the movement of organisms and aid in the maintenance of the ecological processes that, I, as I had mentioned just now, we can then better understand how to develop uh, in a more sustainable and sensitive fashion, taking into consideration the various marine and coastal habitats and also the terrestrial habitat because they are all interconnected. Um, you know, the restoration of nature uh, can be done by integrating blue spaces within our urban landscapes. And I think that is the key uh, focus for URA in the coming decades. Um, and that can be achieved uh, because, um, you know, enhancing climate resilience is not just about maintaining ecosystem integrity and species diversity, uh, but we can also do it through, um, you know, working uh, to um, ameliorate uh, challenges from climate change through uh, these sort of solutions, you know, like we said, integrating uh, our um, integrating our blue spaces into development, trying to make sure that these blue spaces are ecologically resilient, but also be used for other opportunities, for example, recreation. And all these can be carried out with proper planning and by hybrid solutions where we combine nature-based and engineering components together. So this uh, dream of trying to, um, you know, uh, to use these elements to create a better planning for our city is really in, in reach right now. Dr. Jaffa, thank you very much for sharing uh, those details and, and, and analysis with us. Dr. Zihan Jaffa there from the Department of Biological Sciences at NUS.